like that song, and I think that song goes along very well with our message today. As we were singing it, I was thinking about these words that are on the screen now, but if not, and the words in the song, uh, even so, have much the same message for us today. Even so, I will sing praise. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount a little bit in our Sunday school class. Jesus gives uh, a sermon that turns the religious world on its head. And at the end of this, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, we, we hear these words uh, that Christ uh, says about the wise man and the foolish man and their houses. If we can get the next slide, please. As you're looking at these, uh, these words, I want to notice a few things. One of the things I want to notice is that the wise, when they do the words that Christ has said to do, when they hear it and when they do it, when the winds come and the rains come and the storm beats against the house, their house stands firm. The foolish, though, who build their house on the sand, when the storm comes, it knocks it down. There are going to be times when we will be building our house on the rock. There are people that build their house on the rock. There are people that build their house on what Jesus has said, and they do it. They live it. There are people who will build their house in the sand, and it's foolishness, and they don't do it. But the one thing that seems to remain consistent for both of these is the fact that the wind's going to blow, the rain's going to fall, the floods are going to come, and the storms are going to beat on the house. That's a consistent. For the wise and for the foolish, the storms are going to come. There's no escaping it. There's no difference between the weather for the wise or the foolish. The outcome makes all the difference in what you did to prepare for that storm. Jesus understood this. He understood that, that storms were going to come, that trials were going to, to come our way, that hardships were going to happen, and, and that by simply following him, we would not somehow miraculously be unscathed from the world. And so Jesus says, be prepared for the storms. Be wise. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen and do what you have just heard me say. If you're in the book of Daniel chapter 3, as, we've, uh, as was read for us earlier, if you're still there, if not, if you want to turn there, we're going to be looking at this type of attitude that we see in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The book of Daniel is very fascinating. Uh, it's very well known. It's been done a lot in our VBSs, and we talk about it a lot in Sunday schools. But it's a very valuable lesson that we see today uh, that we're going to look at about being prepared for trials, being prepared for hardship, hardships. There's a good chance that we have a lot of folks here today who feel like they are in the middle of a storm. And I hope that we can take some encouragement from what we are uh, going to study today for you. King Nebuchadnezzar is reigning over Babylon. As you know, Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, they had taken over Jerusalem. They had taken in captives. Uh, they're in captivity as we speak. The king takes young boys, men, who are of noble descent, who are of royalty. He takes the, the cream of the crop, and he brings them in Daniel chapter 1 uh, into to really what I would describe as like a training camp. They're trying to take Jewish boys and turn them into Babylonian rulers. And the way that you do that is you teach them everything that they need to know, and you immerse them in the culture of Babylon. And so in Daniel chapter 1, we see this happening. We see Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are known by other names in Daniel chapter 1. We see them being immersed into Babylonian uh, culture. They're going to receive training 
on how to become a Babylonian. And we see the first rub of uh, this training with uh, Daniel when he is offered and told to eat the king's food. And Daniel says, I will not defile what God has told me to eat. And he says, I'm going to stick to the diet that God has prescribed for me. I'm going to stick with what God has said. And we know how that story goes, how uh, the guards are, are hesitant to allow that, but they do it. And at the end of it, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are more, uh, more intelligent. They're healthier, and they've been blessed more because they've done that. We know what the, the issue is here, right? We know how easy it would have been for Daniel to say, you know what, I'm going to eat the king's food. Everybody else is eating the king's food. Everybody around me, no one back home is going to know that I've eaten the king's food. They understand, we understand where he's at with this trial, this temptation. We get the temptation of that, don't we? In Daniel chapter 3, there's another trial that's going to come for, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar has built a 90-foot statue, and he has called everyone into him and said, when you hear the music play, you will bow down and you worship this image. Nebuchadnezzar has a, a God complex, and he wants the entire region to bow down and worship what he has created. And of course, for these three guys, we know the rub that they have with what's going on. We know the, the temptation will be to do this because the consequence for not doing it is dire. And so we get to Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, after the three men refused to bend their knee and worship the golden statue, Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands we we'll to talk about a test of faith a test of, of your where you built your, your house on the rock or the sand we we'll to talk about a storm coming in for these three guys maybe can measure throws everything at them and dares them to not do it. Conform or be killed and what God will save you then. That's a test. That is literally a, a trial by fire. This is a, a, a pivotal moment in their life. I think we need to understand before we read their response that for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there is no guarantee that they are going to make it out of the fire the way that they do. There's been no promise that they will not be killed. There's been no guarantee made to them that they will be unscathed. There's no guarantee for the result of what they say. Faith is tested. Outcomes like this can seem impossible, improbable at best. And the truth of the matter is that the Christian life does not promise an easy life either. There are going to be times that our faith and our determination and our steadfastness will be tested much in the same way because we are not designed for here. We are designed for eternal life. Read with me in John chapter 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. 
In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I think there's a certain degree to which we have to have an understanding that by following Christ, we will have hard times. We will have conflict. We will have struggle. That's not a promise. That's not a guarantee made that we're going to get out of this world unscathed. But the promise is that the one that we follow has overcome the world. And that by following him, we too can do the same. The promise isn't for peace in the world, but peace in Christ. So following him does not equal ease. It equals peace. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are facing a trial, quite literally of fire, to bow down in worship or be destroyed. Those are not two good options, are they? No one says those are, okay, I can pick one of those two. These are, these are both hard things to weigh out. And the world, I'm convinced, does this to us today. It gives us two improbable, impossible options. Be like us, conform to the world, or be put out. We know that this is true. We, we know where this meets, right? Conform to the world or your job won't be as easy. Conform to the world or, or school will be much more difficult. Conform to everything around you or we're going to make life miserable for you. We're not, we're not left out of that in 21st century America as Christians. We get that. We get following Christ can be hard. And so again, as, as was read earlier for us, I want us to see what these men say. Verses 16, 17, and 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Notice verse 18. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What a faith. To say, I know my God is able, and I know that he can, but even if he doesn't. As we sang earlier, even so. But if not, I still will not bow down in worship. Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what God will save you. What God can deliver you from me. And they tell him, what God can, their God can. The true and living God can. But if not faith, it says regardless of the outcome today, I will still serve the creator of the universe. I will still serve the living God. I will still serve the giver of life and the God of my life. But if not, that's the type of faith that I hope that we all have that regardless of what comes, regardless of how this world treats me, I will still serve the Lord. What a faith. I want to give us three points today that I want us to consider, and then the lesson is yours. When we're building a, a but-if-not faith, there's three things that I think that we have to keep in mind. One is that I have to trust God to I put dot, 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 but you can fill in the blanks. I have to trust God to deliver. They trusted that God could deliver them from a fiery furnace. I have to trust that God is a keeper of promises. I have to trust that God loves me and cares for me and that God is capable. In verse 24 of Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar says was astonished when he sees that the, the fire had not consumed them and he declared to his counselors did we not cast three men into the fire they answered the king and said true O king 
He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. God is a deliverer. He is present. God did not stop the fire, but he was present in the fire. Isaiah chapter 43, starting at verse 1, says, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. God will be present. And if you've ever paid attention in your trials, if you've ever paid attention when hardship comes, you can point to where God was present in those times with you. I can say, but if not, because I know that God will deliver me, even if it hurts for a while, the outcome will remain the same. Along with this, knowledge that God is a deliverer is to know what the end game is, to know how it ends. We know how it ends, right? That's a, that's a good thing about being in Christ. You know the, the end of the story. It does not end in a fiery furnace. It does not end here. This story ends with redemption. This story ends with eternity. Where I'm looking and what I'm looking forward to has a lot to do with my perspective of my faith, where I'm putting the eternal. I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In our groups tonight, this may be a good passage to turn to, to look at. But I want to skip down to, to verse 17. And it says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are are eternal. He talks about all the things that afflict them, all the things that cause them, them trouble and drama and problems here. We compare them to just, man, they're just so minuscule in comparison to the eternal glory that awaits. If I want to have a but if not faith, I've got to know that this is not where I'm living for. And I've also got to know that the hardships and the trials that are here, man, they should make me want to be in eternity even more. They prepare us and they motivate us to live eternally. Second Peter, First Peter 2 reminds us to live as sojourners and exiles in this land, to never be comfortable here, never setting up roots in this world. Because all that we see and all that we endure here, it, it passes away. So, but if not, faith helps us to, to live for the next. And then finally, one of the greatest ways to, to have a but if not faith, I believe, is to prepare for these moments. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did not wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm going to defy a king today. They didn't just happened by happenstance they had prepared their entire life for that they were as if as the wise men that Jesus says they they built their house on a rock because they they listened to and they did what Christ had commanded we can prepare in the same way James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 reminds us to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds because when we come out of that trial that produces a steadfastness in our faith. We should be looking for moments today to be growing in our faith, to prepare ourselves to face times that we need to say, but if not. We prepare today 
to face the trials of tomorrow. Life may be great today, and that is awesome. Prepare today for the times when life may be hard. Get prepared today for when the storms come and the rains fall and the floods come. This applies to, to everything that we want to do, pushing through to completion. Prepare like a wise man. For most of us, our faith will, will most likely not be tested by a fiery furnace. I'm going to be pretty surprised if this ever happens and plays out in my life. I hope it doesn't. I'm going to be honest with you. It's not something I would look forward to much. But for these three guys, their faith was tested by a fiery furnace. Your faith is going to be tested. Your steadfastness and your determination is going to be tested. You're going to be tested every day with apathy. You're going to be tested every day to, to come to church but not really live out a Christian life. That's where the rub hits for most of us today. You're going to be tested to, to shoot and strive for comfort instead of discipleship. You're going to be tested to find ways that are easy and not the way that leads to glory. We're going to be tested. And our answer is going to largely depend upon our faith. And I hope and pray that today your faith would be able, like these three men, to say, but if not. We serve a great God. We serve a God who is capable, and he is able, and he is present. And we serve a God who, who has prepared for us a home that's not made for here. We serve a God who has given us a son so that we can live for glory, and we can live for eternity. I hope that my faith and your faith today is not caught up in the world around me. I hope today that you're living as if you are a sojourner or an exile on this planet. I hope that you don't get as excited about what's going on around you in your, in your town and in, in your lives on this world as you do about the, the weight of, of glory and the eternal life that's to come. I hope that when you face a trial, you, you see the the ability to, to gain from that, and that's preparing you for something that is to come. I hope today that, that if you've not had this but if not faith, that you'll ask for prayers, that you'll start preparing for that today. It's my hope that if, if you have struggled with the storms in your life, with the trials that you're facing, that if you need this church family who loves you so much to pray for you, that you'll come when we sing our song of invitation. I hope that, that if you are feeling as if you are drowning in the floods that have wiped away your homes, that you will, you will put your trust in God today and in the body that he has given us here in this building. Pray that today, if you've never put your trust in God and said, I want to change my life and I want to be baptized. I want to put on Christ so that, that I have the ability to look forward to an eternity. Pray that if you've never been baptized, that today, what a day to do that, to start this faith journey around all these people who love you so much. We're going to sing a song. And if anyone has need, would you come now as we stand and sing?